welcome guys. I'll appreciate you doing the right thing today, which is to take your notes and be really conscious of um, moving forward with the French Revolution, despite the fact that I'm not there. So hopefully this helps. So yesterday we talked about the storming of the Bastille and the tennis court oath and the new National Assembly and all sorts of things and how violence is breaking out. And today we are going to continue to talk about the impact that that has. So here you see the General Assembly that hadn't met in a long, long time that was brought together in yesterday's lesson and how when they were locked out by the king because he kind of goes back on his word, changes his mind, locks them out, protests begin and the storming of the Bastille happens on July 14th. And this leads to kind of mass panic. So we're going to start right here with a great fear sweeping through France. And then we'll also do the beginning of section two today. So a little bit of the end of one and the beginning of two. Before long, rebellion had spread from Paris into the countryside. And from one village to the next, wild rumors circulated that nobles were hiring outlaws to terrorize and maybe even kill the pe peasants. A wave of senseless panic called the great fear rolled through France. Peasants soon became outlaws themselves. They armed themselves with anything they could find, pitchforks and farm tools. They broke into nobles' manor houses, destroyed old legal papers that bound them to pay feudal dues, and in some cases the peasants just burned down the manor houses altogether. On October of 1789, thousands of Parisian women rioted over the rising price of bread. They brandished knives and axes and other weapons, and women marched on to Versailles, to the, to the castle at Versailles. First, they demanded that the National Assembly take action to provide just bread itself, but then they turned their anger onto the king and queen. They broke into the palace. They demanded that Louis and Marie Antoinette return to Paris. After some time, Louis agreed out of fear. And a few hours later, the king and his family and his servants left Versailles, never again to see this magnificent palace. Their exit signaled the changing of power and radical reforms that were about to overtake France. A little transition here. Or we transition to section two. So now King Louis and Marie Antoinette have fled Versailles and the revolution will, I guess, continue. I was going to say begin, but in effect, it's a continuation. So again, you should write Roman numeral two. The revolution brings reform and terror. So peasants weren't the only members of French society to feel the great fear. Nobles and officers of the church were really afraid as well. I mean, their stuff, their, their property is being attacked, right? Throughout France, bands of angry peasants struck out against members of upper classes attacking and destroying the manor houses, as we already discussed. And in the summer of 1789, a few months before the women's march to Versailles about the bread, some nobles and members of the clergy in the National Assembly responded to the uprisings in a really emotional late-night meeting. Okay, we haven't actually read about Marie Antoinette and King Louis, but we will next week. little uh, foreshadowing of what is to come on the left. <laughs> You'll find out that Marie Antoinette and King Louis spent a lot of money, which is why the reference to Madame Deficit... Of course, both of them are eventually going to die, but not quite yet, historically speaking. Okay. Throughout the night of August 4th of 1789, noblemen made grand speeches, declaring their love of liberty and equality. Motivated more by fear than by idealism, they joined the other members of the National Assembly in sweeping away the feudal privileges of the first and second estates and making commoners equal to the nobles and the clergy. By morning, that old regime, the old regime that, that was the first and second and third estate, was gone. In its place, the rights of man. Three weeks later, the National Assembly adopted a statement of revolutionary ideals. It was called the Declaration of the Rights of Man and of the Citizen. Reflecting the influence of the Declaration of Independence, the document stated that men are born and remain free and equal in rights. These rights included life, liberty, property, security, and resistance to oppression. The document also guaranteed citizens equal justice, freedom of speech, 
and freedom of religion. In keeping with the principles, the revolutionary leaders adopted the expression, liberty, equality, fraternity, as their slogan. Such sentiments, however, did not apply to everyone. When writer Olympic de Gauges published a declaration of the rights of women, her ideas were completely rejected. And later in 1793, she was declared an enemy of the state and executed for that. So here she is up here. Olympia, I'm sorry, but you are writing uh, ahead of your time. And so she lost her head. I know you needed that in order to understand that whole concept. Yeah. Okay. A state-controlled church. Many of the National Assembly's early reforms focused on the church. The assembly took over the church's lands. Remember that 1% of the clergy controlled 10% of the land. So this is a big chunk of land for the, for the new National Assembly to now control. So the assembly took the church's lands and declared that church officials and priests were now going to be elected and paid as state officials. So the Catholic Church lost both its land and its independence, and in part its political power. The reasons for the Assembly's actions were largely economic, largely economic. Proceeds from the sale of the Church's lands helped pay off France's very large debt. The Assembly's actions alarmed millions of French peasants who were devout Catholics, and even though they resented the fact that the First Estate um, had a lot of undue power, it's really hard to undo the kind of the religious uh, ties that um, somebody has to their community, and that's that's a lot that's a lot of, that's a lot of foundation shaking for people who, especially people that are poor. The Assembly's actions alarmed millions of French peasants who were devout Catholics, and the effort to make the church part of the state offended many, including them. Though it was in accord with Enlightenment philosophy, they believed that the Pope should rule over the church, independent of the state. And from this time on, many peasants opposed some of the Assembly's reforms because of that. No, I lost. Okay, last piece. As the National Assembly restructured the relationship between the church and the state, Louis could see the writing on the wall, and he was really worried about what was going to happen with him and what they were going to do to him. And so, as the National Assembly restructured the relationship between the church and state, Louis pondered his fate as a monarch. Some of his advisors warned him that he and his family were in real danger. Many supporters of the monarchy thought France was unsafe and left the country. In June of 1791, the royal family tried to escape from France to the Austrian Netherlands. Now, one of the reasons that they did this was because Marie Antoinette was from Austria, and they had an extended family there that they thought would protect them. The problem was that as they tried to escape, they were nearing the border, but they got caught. They were apprehended, returned to Paris under guard. Louis' attempt to escape only increased the amount of frustration that people felt toward him, and it increased the influence of his radical enemies in the government to seal his unfortunate fate, which included this little baby, the guillotine.
So the guillotine was actually created by a doctor who wanted to create a humane way um, to execute. And this little baby just gives you a sense of like how that worked. So the executioner like cranked, you can see the guy um, standing on the platform, um, would crank the blade up with a mechanism, and there was a mechanism that released it. It was a weighted blade, so it would fall at a certain momentum that was intended to be able to uh, execute with a single um, drop of the blade. I'm sure you can read these captions, but just in case you'd rather look at the pictures, there were, there were some doctors and some people that believed the victim's head retained its hearing and eyesight for up to 15 minutes after the deadly blow. All remains were eventually gathered and buried in simple graves. And one thing that I have asked before on the test is about these knitters at the bottom. I mean, it's kind of interesting that these public executions are taking place and these knitters, especially during the French Revolution, were knitting what they intended to be like socks and things for the soldiers that were going to then go off and fight in this revolution. And it's kind of like this patriotic move that the, that the people that opposed to the revolution are being killed behind them while they, they uh, provide for the troops that are going to continue the good fight for the people. Okay, just a reminder of some of these uh, Enlightenment thinkers that have influenced uh, the thinking of the revolution. You know, Thomas Hobbes, people need some sort of order or they will fight to the last man, kind of Lord of Flies-ish. Okay, John Locke saying no, people can be left to themselves and have natural rights that they ought to be granted if a government isn't supporting your natural rights as a person that you ought to look to change it. Jean-Jacques Rousseau in The Social Contract that said that if a government isn't working on behalf of the people that you have a responsibility to overthrow said government and work towards something else. Rousseau actually had a lot of other interesting thoughts that we'll read about next week. Okay, we're going to leave it off right there. Thank you very much for the work that you are doing. We'll talk to you Monday.